I'm Rita Hilton and I'm from Mombasa, Kenya. The, the person that I met was to become a husband, his name was Guy. The bond got very, very close and, and, and strong. And um, the relationship got very strong, but I, I got a lot of negative feedback from my family because here was somebody who was not a Roman Catholic, who was not of our religion, who was not of our race, who was not of, and my parents just kind of flipped. Yeah. And put a lot of guilt on, on me. So he was in San Francisco and I was in London. And we communicated, we talked on the phone, we, we liaised. The chugging of the emotions became very, very supreme. And I went back to Kenya and Guy, my fiance at that time, proceeded back to Jamaica to work. So the situation went on until two, two terms. I was teaching now in a girls' high school in Kenya and um, I we decided that I would come to Jamaica for the Easter holiday and see how we felt about each other emotionally. And I never went back. <laughs> I came for two weeks, I told my mom, I'll be back. I never went back. And that was it, that's the story. And I stayed in Jamaica and got married two weeks later. And 55 years, here am I. Very precocious, very rebellious very going against the standard, pushing, um, did, did, broke the rules all the time. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I've, I've tempered since then, but yes, I was in love. Simple. That was it. That's what ruled my mind, my heart, everything. Get married and and still be that, although that marriage broke up later, much later, we are still friends and he's the father of my children and I would do it all over again, but I'd handle it a little differently. So I started teaching almost immediately because there was no geography teacher at Mount Alvernia High School. And um, so they were very happy to have me there. And I started to do practical field work, which they'd never done and thinking outside the box. And so it was a very, good experience being based. And I was able to travel on the railway from Montego Bay to Kingston. It was such an amazing experience. And um, I, I miss that part of, of Jamaica, you know. And when I when we eventually came into Kingston, I now find, found a job teaching at, at St. Hugh's High School, where I taught for another 14 years. So it was just very fulfilling. Those were the amazing days of my life. I just found teaching a very fulfilling and rewarding occupation and profession. I just loved it. I taught for many years and now my kids, my own kids were growing up and getting ready for university. And my husband was a civil servant and I was a teacher. And we just couldn't find a way to get them to university. And although we had got scholarships, both of us, they, they, those opportunities now were no longer, because remember the countries were independent and they were already fulfilling their, their roles uh, in terms of professions. Now we had to find a way to fund these kids. So he was still in the forestry profession. Um, and so I, I decided to make the change. And the first job I went into was banking, which I did not enjoy. It was very boring. And I was watching the clock, you know, where we're teaching. I was constantly timing my lessons and I never had enough time. I was marking books and, and teaching kids and going on field trips. I just, I, I couldn't wrap my head around this, the, the, the numbers and the, no, no, I just couldn't. And that didn't last more than a year and I had to leave. And then I found another opportunity, the opportunity in that sector came to a head because again, I was making decisions and it had to go through four or five levels of management. And I found it very, very frustrating. And eventually I got fired. 
So I decided I am not going to work for anybody anymore. I am going to try and find an opportunity. It was very depressing. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't, you know, I'm finding my feet and I'm exhilarated and and here am I going into into business. It was a soul searching time and a depressing time because I thought I really wasn't good for anything. Um, I, I could not find my soul or my niche or whatever you want to call it. I just couldn't find it. So I went through a very difficult time at that time. But um, there was a friend of a friend in New York and he said to me, why don't you ship me some scotch bonnet peppers? I need some peppers in New York and the scotch bonnet peppers really have the flavor and the intensity of what I want. For that time, it seemed to me large. But in terms of now, it wasn't a large shipment, but it meant then I had to go through the whole process of learning about exports. And at that time, it was by air, it was Air Jamaica. So, and that led to breadfruit, and that led to time, and that led to other things as the demand grew and the business grew. But it was, it was quite tedious, it was quite onerous, and there was no handbook. You had to get a license for this and a license for that and go to this agency and that agency um, to register and go to customs and fill out tons and tons of forms. And also you had unscrupulous buyers in there, right? The first one I dealt with was very fair and wonderful. And so we went through those kinds of challenges and it was all a learning curve. So all of that I learned or taught myself how to do that. And I just had one person with me. At that time, it meant packing, it meant loading the truck, it meant going to the airport, it meant doing the shipping documents and doing every little thing. When I started, I just made contact with different farmers. I was able to make some connections, mainly by visiting farms, going to farmers and getting the produce. The banks, they were very difficult. Again, being a woman, uh, the first the first loan I got, they wanted my husband to sign, not me. And then, you know, you had that era when the interest rate went sky high. So I had a bank account um, manager in the bank who said to me, Rita, I notice you, you're going a little bit over. Why don't you take an overdraft limit of, say, $500,000, right? And I'm talking about in the early 90s. Well, that escalated to the point I almost lost everything. It was like 4% per month or more, you know? The interest rate was very, very high, 49%, 50%, 60%. And a lot of people lost their businesses. So in the end, I found a woman banker. She said to me, open a different account. I'll let you open a different account and start your business. And this was at NCB Bank in Hagley Park. And she sat me down and said, now you're dealing and this, this account is looking okay. What are you doing about the one that went? I've just ignored it. She said, you can't. You have to go back and negotiate. And that was a very good lesson. You cannot ignore things and and the fact that you might have failed doesn't mean you're a failure and that brought the realization to me that i can't give up and i'm not a failure and i have to persevere so i went in the bank and i negotiated for them to they let me keep my car but i lost all my investments everything that was on deposit everything i had i lost i said to them would if i paid you Let's say the debt now was $250,000, what was left of the debt. If I pay you back 70000 would you forgive the rest? And they did. And so I made good that and then proceeded again. One of the lessons I've learned in my business is to recognize when something is not going well and to put an end to it immediately, to cut it. Like, for example, if I felt like somebody in my organization was not helpful and was not contributing to the team goals to act. Because sometimes you continue and you pursue with somebody 
and they're not the right fit for where you want to go or where the business should be going. And that recognition is very critical to the success of a business. The company was registered as marketing developments in 1984. And uh, as we grew and the business expanded and our markets in, um, grew as well, we found that people, uh, the customers or potential customers were calling us thinking that we were a marketing company. And that gave a kind of false impression. We are not a marketing company in that sense. So we, in 2011 or 2010, we said we need to change this image of this company. And so we, but we wanted to keep the Caribbean flavor because I'm very passionate about that. Whatever we do must be based in Jamaica or the Caribbean, but we haven't really gone beyond our shores. And so we looked at Caribbean and then we hit on this name Carita, taking the C-A-R from Caribbean and my name Rita. And so we thought that gave you a better idea of the person behind the business as well as the Caribbean flavor that we wanted. And so we re renamed the company in 2011. Carita is based mainly on exporting Jamaican produce. 95% of our business is fresh produce. And about four or five years ago, I wanted to stop being just a shipper of raw materials. That's a colonial mentality we must shift from and we must add value to what we are shipping. So that in, instead of shipping breadfruit as a raw breadfruit, which is what most Jamaicans know is raw breadfruit, roast breadfruit. So it can be turned into flour, it can be turned into fries, it can be turned, it can be boiled, it can be made into a bread. So there are so many, and as you add value, you're, you're, you're adding income. The returns to, the, to Jamaica are better than just shipping a piece of yam. If you um, took a sweet potato and turned it into flour, dehydrated it, it's, it's gluten-free. So we have a lot of sweet potato, we have a lot of cassava, we have a lot of breadfruit, and these are all gluten-free products and they can be turned into pancakes, waffle mixes, bread mixes, fries, a whole lot of products, which bring more earnings, foreign exchange earnings to Jamaica. Also, uh, you're helping nutrition, you're increasing the nutritional value of food intake in Jamaica, you're increasing food security in Jamaica. And so to me, this is where we should be going. We shouldn't be shipping out turmeric, we should be desiccating it, we must be putting it into curries, into pastes, into capsules and taking it in different forms. No, but we ship it out as raw material and then we're bringing back all these imported value-added products at some phenomenal prices. That's not right. That's not right. It's depriving our country of foreign exchange potential. And not only that, it is stopping us from raising the standard of living of our people at the base of the, of, the, of, of the sector, of the agricultural sector. We have to improve their returns. We have to improve their lifestyle, you know. So, so to me, although I'm shipping all this fresh produce out, I want to see more value added. And as I said, this is how we grew into adding a dimension of value added products. So it's a gluten-free flour, um, we opened a, a small but very interesting market on the west coast of the U.S. into a Pacific Island population uh, concentration that wants all kinds of breadfruit products from boiled to, to roasted to, to baked to fermented breadfruit, flour. You know, I don't know how to do that yet, but I'm going to learn absolutely passionate about raising the standard of living of Jamaican farmers. I wish I could get farmers to work cooperatively so that we can market cooperatively and get the best deal for the farmers. That's what I would like to see. Not for me, I don't need material benefits. I find joy in what I do. I find joy in influencing somebody's life. I find joy in making somebody more productive and uh, having uh, a better standard of living. I want to see 
education improve and that's why I'm still um, active on school boards as well as you know contributing to the standard of living. I employ mainly women because I, f I want, they are the breadwinners uh, in this organization and I want to see them raise healthy and productive kids so that they can become better citizens in this country. I would encourage people to to, to look at these global markets because, you know, Jamaica has a name. Jamaica has a name far in excess of the size of this country. Um, sports, in food, in music. And we have not really realized, other countries are realizing our potential and we need to take more advantage of our potential. So here there's a huge potential market. But what we need to do is to make sure that we follow all the protocols. And that's where I help anybody who comes. And I don't charge. My knowledge is there and available for anybody who wants it. And I encourage all my farmers who come to me, all entrepreneurs who come to me, make sure your records and your record keeping is in place. Because that wasn't a criteria so, so many years ago when I started. But it is now. And it's very critical. <laughs> What is Rita's legacy? Rita's legacy has been creating an awareness for Jamaican food, for the love and passion of what it can do in terms of nutrition, but exciting the palate. That is my legacy. <laughs>